into a second, but it also should put into you a sense of identity. How much did God value you? Think about that for a minute. God looked at you, Larry. God looked at you, Mike. God looked at you, Diane. And he said, this is the value I place on you. I will purchase you with blood. Does so I give you the shivers? It better. Or you have no concept of the gospel and the salvation that is ours in Christ. Wow. So what's my response? The fourth statement that Paul makes in verses 19 20 is this. Therefore, in light of this, because you're the temple of the Holy Spirit, that you're not your own, because you were bought with a price, therefore, glorify God in your body. Glorify. Lift God up. Make God famous. Obey God. Show honor to God. Respect God. Lift up His name. However you want to phrase that. Glorify God in your body. The way you live. Because he's talking about this physical existence that we have. How will I conduct myself in relationships with other people? We all probably could quote Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. I present myself, my body, how I live as a sacrifice to God. A holy sacrifice. Glorify God in your body. But why is Paul writing all this? Let's backtrack a bit into the earlier verses, 12 through 18. There is a lot in these verses. There are phrases that I'm not even going to touch in my sermon today. If you have questions, feel free to ask them of me later. I'll try to walk you through stuff as best as I understand it. But take note of what's going on. Paul has to write these words because the Christians of Corinth seem to be using their freedom in Christ as a license for sin. As with our culture, theirs was one that was rampant with sexual immorality. It was sexually charged. If you remember the first sermon, an introductory sermon to this series in 1 Corinthians, just outside of Corinth was this mount, and upon it sat a temple in which lived a thousand priestesses. Those priestesses celebrated the worship of that Greek god through sexual activity. They were basically temple prostitutes. That's the city in which they lived, okay? That's what they had known all their days. And now Paul's coming and he's bringing this new concept. And he has to help them understand. So he begins in verse 12. He says, you say all things are lawful. Hey, I tell you, not everything's profitable or beneficial, depending on your translation. You're saying everything's lawful, but let me ask you this. Is it lawful for me to murder my wife because she burnt my breakfast? Get real. No, it's not. Is it lawful for me to embezzle money from the church because, hey, I need a raise? And I'm not saying that because I need a raise. I'm going to hear from it from the elders. No, it's not lawful. That's a transgression of the, the heart and the will of God and His holiness. Is it lawful for me to have an adulterous affair because I saw someone who was handsome or someone who was beautiful? No. You see, the church in Corinth didn't understand that. They said everything's lawful. Paul says, no, not everything's beneficial. They said, yes, everything's lawful. And Paul says, I'll not be mastered by anything. I like that one. I think of, and I'm not picking, but I think of the alcoholic who says, I can stop drinking anytime I want. Oh, really? Yeah, I can stop drinking anytime I want. I just don't want. Uh-huh, stop. No. Or think of any vice. I don't care what it is. Think of any sinful vice that grips us and takes a hold of us, and we think we're the master. 
No, it's not. The alcohol's the master. The pornography is the master. The gossip's the master. Whatever it is. And Paul says, I will not be mastered by anything. I am not going to let sin have the upper hand. I am not a servant of sin. I'm the temple of God. And I will glorify him with my body. And so he says things in here, like the body's not for immorality, but for the Lord. I want people to be able to look at you and me and to say, I see Jesus in you. And the way you carry yourself, and the way you conduct yourself, and the behaviors of your life, and the choices that you make, man, you sure look like Jesus as I understand him to be. And well, we should. Why? Because the Holy Spirit lives in us. The Spirit of Jesus lives in us. We're His temple. This is where His glory is revealed. <laughs> Paul says our bodies are members of Christ. Our bodies are members of Christ. We've been united with Christ. And so he says, why in the world would we, who are members of Christ, engage in sexual immorality? He says, why would we even think of joining ourselves, say, to a prostitute? Don't you understand that the two become one flesh, and so we're taking Christ and engaging him in that which is sinful? Don't do that. You've joined yourself to the Lord. You're one with him in spirit, in verse 17. We are members of Christ. And our bodies are for him, not for immorality. Not because God is some kind of cosmic killjoy, but because he knows how we are designed. He created us, and he knows how best we can live as men and women. And so let's get practical for a minute. The first thing that I would say in application, I've already talked about. Paul himself tells us, <laughs> glorify God in your body. Seek to honor God in the way that you live. Very simple. In relationship with your spouse, with your children, with your neighbors, with your employers, with your co-workers, with your employees, with your fellow brothers and sisters in the church, with your elders. Live in a way that God is always exalted and seen. That God is present in everything. You see, as Christians, we don't just live for Sunday morning. God gets me from 10.30 to 11.45 on Sunday morning. And the rest of the time, I'm just kind of living my life. And then God gets me from 10.30 to 11.45 on Sunday morning. No, don't do that, please. <laughs> You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. But there's something else that Paul says in verse 18. It's two little words. Flee immorality. Flee. The idea is run, forest, run. Forest Gump, run. Oh, forget it. I didn't really like Forrest Gump's movie, but if you remember the movie, he starts running, and he runs, and he runs, and he runs. And that's the idea here. It's run, and don't stop running. Get away from immorality. Do we need an illustration besides forest? Yeah, probably. Book of Genesis, chapter 39. If you've grown up in church, you've heard this probably as a Sunday school lesson or in VBS class or somewhere. Maybe your C4 sponsors have used this text for you. But the, the, the story is Joseph. Not Joseph and Mary of Jesus' parentage, but, but Joseph, the son of Jacob, whose brothers sold him into slavery because they were jealous of him. So he winds up in Egypt, a slave sold to a fellow by the name of Potiphar. I can't help but see Donny Osmond in a coat of many colors. Oh, well. Joseph was a man of integrity. Joseph was a man who loved God. This is in Genesis 39, and I'm beginning about halfway, two-thirds through verse 6. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. 
That's a powerful little statement, isn't it? Okay, we all pick on guys who may have a tendency to go, oh, she's very pretty, or she has a nice form and appearance. But sometimes ladies see that one guy, you know, he's, he's got the, the rippled muscles and he's got the six-pack abs. I, I have abs somewhere, I don't know where. <laughs> They're hidden. But Joseph was the kind of guy that the women would take a second glance at. You know, he, he's the kind of guy who would have been a model on a magazine cover. Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And it came about after these events, okay, he's being sold into slavery and all that kind of stuff, that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph. And she saw him and said, ooh, Potiphar's away on a business trip. He's a pretty good-looking fella. And she says, lie with me, which is Old Testament language for come to bed with me. But he refused. Here's an open door. Here's an opportunity. How many scoundrels would have said, okay, not Joseph. He refused. He said to her, Behold, with me here, my master doesn't concern himself with anything in the house. He has put all that he owns in my charge. You see, Joseph was a man of such integrity that Potiphar trusted him. Trusted him with everything. There is no one greater in his house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against? Do you know the story? How could I do this great evil and sin against you? That's not what it says. Sin against Potiphar? That's not what it says. Sin against myself? That's not what it says. How could I do this great evil and sin against God? How could I sin against God? By consenting to your lust. As she spoke to Joseph day after day, man, she was relentless. She was not one to give up. He did not listen to her to lie beside her or to be with her. You know, just, lady, stay away from me. Let me do my work. You stay away from me. So she's on the east end of the house. He's in the west end of the house. Okay? Now it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the household was there inside. She caught him by his garment saying, Lie with me! And he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. Now the story will unfold. She will lay charges against him that he had assaulted her. Potiphar believes his wife and he leaves this place of prestige in Potiphar's house and is placed in the dungeons of Egypt. He goes to prison, and the story will continue. But do you, then you notice? He fled. Run, Joseph, run. Run. And he did. That's pretty important for us to see. You know, Paul tells us in the New Testament, basically this, the same thing. It's in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. And I want you to catch this because there's actually two things here. He says, Timothy, now flee from youthful lusts. There you go. Run, Timothy, run. Flee youthful lusts. But there's a third thing that we have to grasp here from a practical aspect. Glorify God in your body. Flee immorality. The third thing, though, while you're running, why don't you run in a good direction? He says, pursue run toward, go after, make a goal of, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Ah, Timothy, run toward righteousness. Run toward Christ-likeness. Run toward the kind of life and living that reveals that the Holy Spirit is in you as you are its, His temple. Run after faith. Don't let go your grip 
on the teachings of Scripture, on the Gospel of Christ, on the message of the Kingdom of God. Run toward faith and hold on to the truth. Pursue love. Not the lusts of this world. Not trying to find love of an absent father or a non-existent woman. But pursue the love of God. And pursue peace. For when you live as God intended you to live, the Prince of Peace reigns in your life. And no matter what circumstance you find yourself in, even the deepest, darkest dungeons of the Egyptian prison in the Old Testament days, you will find that you have peace. I, I, I want to encourage you this morning to take the words of, of God through the, the Apostle Paul seriously. I, I want to encourage you. We live, <laughs> we live in a day probably not a whole lot different than the days of Corinth in the first century of Paul. Do what you will. Make your own decisions. Be your own man. Be your own woman. Forget this idea that you're the temple of the Holy Spirit bought with a price. You know, you can't turn on the TV and watch your favorite sitcom or crime drama without some kind of sexual innuendo or euphemism, let alone something just very blatantly out there for you to see or hear. You can't turn on the radio and listen to music, unless you listen to WCIC, without hearing Things that are pretty explicit. I had a conversation with Brody not too long ago, and I simply pointed out, you know, we get upset about the music that kids listen to today, but I'll be honest, I grew up in the 60s and 70s. What was my music about? Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. All right? Maybe we weren't as blatant as the music today, but it was the same message. Teach your children and your grandchildren well. Don't leave it to Kids City and Youth Group. One, because we have them for a very minuscule amount of time in the days of their lives. And sometimes when we talk about things like this, people get a little uncomfortable. Why are you talking about sex? Don't do that in church. Well, it's here. It's on the pages of my book. But don't leave it to the church to teach your children and your grandchildren. Please don't leave it to the public school system. The curriculum that's coming out and being put upon the minds and the hearts of your children and grandchildren is foul. It is foul. May God have mercy on the Illinois Department of Education but may they repent. And if we just sit by idly and say nothing to our kids and grandkids, we're just as guilty. So don't get mad at them. And this wasn't in my sir sermon, but pray for our teachers. We have teachers in our midst. Christian men and women. Pray for them, because it can't be easy. It can't be easy. I get to talk to people who go, oh yeah, Bill, I know. Yeah, that's, yeah, right. Preach it, pre preach it, preacher. <laughs> they get to go to a school system and sometimes be told you can't talk like that. <laughs> that's tough. And you yourself, whether you're in your youth or your hair is gray or you don't have any hair, <laughs> glorify God in your body. Glorify God in your body. Flee immorality. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. That's going to cause you to go against the grain of this world, my friends. It is going to cause you to go against the grain of this world. You will be called prudish. You will be called bigoted. You will be called judgmental. You'll be called all kinds of things. But just live the life. 
that Christ has called you to. Just live it. Let your life speak louder than your words. And so I choose to close today repeating what you have heard a half a dozen times already this morning. Hear the words of the Apostle Paul, not only to the church in Corinth 2,000 years ago, but to the church in Creve Corps today. Remember who you are, my friends. Do you not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And you, you're not your own. For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Would you stand as we sing? come to that time in our worship service, and truly this is worship, where Jesus invites us to his table. It is his table. It's his meal. He is the host. And he says, come and share with me. Isn't that cool? I want to take you to a passage of scripture I used in my sermon, and I want to walk through it a little bit slower than I did when I preached. It's the text in 1 Peter chapter 1 beginning at verse 17. If you address as Father, that's a relationship statement. God is our Father. Jesus taught us to pray what? Our Father. And He loves us with a love that is perfect and pure. If you address as Father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, Conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. Just glorify God with your body. But here's what I want us to take into the Lord's Supper, into communion. Verse 18. Knowing that you were not redeemed. There's that word that I love. You weren't purchased. You weren't bought. You weren't 
taken by God in the slave market. You weren't redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold. Think of how much we value silver and gold. Now, I don't know the history well enough to know what point in time in history someone found gold in the ground and said, this is worth a lot. I've got a lot of rocks in my yard. They don't seem to be worth anything. But gold and silver. You know, even if you listen to financial reports, the price of gold today is so much per ounce. And silver is up. Nine dollars an ounce. And we value these things, don't we? And yet, what does Peter say? You were not redeemed with perishable things. Silver and gold is not going to continue with us into eternity, folks, except as paving material in heaven. What we value here has no value. Those things will perish. He didn't redeem us with perishable things like silver and gold from your futile way of life, the, the sinful way of life, the hopeless way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood. Take time to notice the adjective. Peter could have simply said, he redeemed you with blood. He redeemed you with precious blood. Is there anyone precious in your life? A spouse, a child, a grandchild. We know what it is for someone to be precious to us, do we not? And God redeemed us with precious blood. His one and only begotten that he gave for us. Don't lose sight of that, folks. He didn't just say, hey, Bill over there, he's a schmuck, let him die for everybody. Besides the fact that I have my own sins and that wouldn't work. That's not what God did. He took his only son. But with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the perfect sacrifice, the only sacrifice, the blood of Christ. That's 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 17 through 19. I encourage you to ponder those words. Jesus himself said, do this in remembrance of me. We write it on our table. And so today, as we come to his table and share in his meal, we take the wafer and we're mindful that Jesus took bread and he broke it and he blessed it and he gave it to him and said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. And likewise, after the meal, he took a cup. And he said, this is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the forgiveness of sins of many. Do this in remembrance of me. Our Father, we come to the table and our hearts are thankful. Father, it makes me shiver with the thought that you dwell within. That you paid the ultimate price because you value me and you value my brothers and sisters sitting here this morning so much that you wanted us to be your own. We are yours. And so thank you for the bread and the cup. Thank you for the body and the blood. Thank you for the sacrifice and the forgiveness that is ours in Christ. As we leave this morning, may we live in a way that brings glory to you. In Jesus we pray. Amen. We're so happy that you were able today to join us today, both in person and online. Um, I hope that you um, can, can live work on living that out, uh, being uh, glorifying God as you go about your activities this week. Would you uh, please stand to sing with us? <laughs>